Welcome back to the Net Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, before we get started, we got some big news. Um, Tom has an executive assistant now, so we might be kicking him off the show. We're not sure yet. Um, we're not sure how we feel about it, to be honest. So. <laughs> All depends on if it's scheduled or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got a, we've got new gatekeepers here. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, we're coming in hot today. Let's bring the energy, guys. Uh, we've got a really great guest. Um, I'm Brent Salisbury, by the way. I'm uh, accompanied by uh, my partners in crime here: Dave Tucker, Kyle Mestre, Tom Nadeau, some of the best in the business. Uh, lucky to have uh, have this platform with them. So thanks for joining us. Today we have Jason Edelman, and so I've known Jason for a long time now, and other than like, you know, I think Jason probably wrote one of the first books on automation with some of those folks. Um, while while in the early days of SDN, some of us were like, hey, how do we kind of redo, you know, packet forwarding paradigms and, and kind of move packet processing to the edge? Jason was going uh, probably a much more practical route and saying, let's fix existing problems and let's figure out how to automate and DevOps network infrastructures uh, and it really is it's actually I think just as hard of a problem if not maybe even harder because you know you, you're not getting a clean slate there you're carrying along a lot of baggage tons of technical debt and existing infrastructures that have to be dealt with so uh, yeah with that uh, Jason's got a startup called network to code he's you know kicking ass over there we're uh we're super super proud of him and uh excited to see where he's going with it because he's really he's changing the world in his his area so jason what's up man oh hey guys thanks for having me really looking forward to this and yeah it's been crazy to say we've met probably close to it might be close to 10 years i think it was probably 2011 or 12 when this sdn boom started and it's amazing to see you know what's transpired over this last decade but you know, thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. Yeah, awesome. So, guys, uh, any, anybody have any opening questions they want to start on? Where do we want to pile in on? Yeah, well, well maybe, kick it off. you know, Jason, tell us a little bit about, and I'll stop calling you Jeremy. Uh, Jason, <laughs> luckily yeah, I was Jeremy muted back Shulman. then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, well, tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, where you, your journey, you know. How, how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's always a question I love thinking about and you know, trying to go back over the past you know ten or twenty years. But like many of you, uh, born and raised network engineer, spent spent a career in in networking. Some as an engineer, you know, joined Cisco in technical sales, joined the VAR world, and you know did more traditional networking there. But you know, if I kind of hone in on the on the last you know really ten years. You know, it's to be quite honest, I remember somebody sent me, you might have covered this on one of your old podcasts too, like the, you know, the Stanford, the Stanford crowd when they, when they came about 2010 or 11, but I remember somebody sending me like a link to read and it ended up going back to, to, you know, the original white paper from Stanford that, you know, Martine and crew, you know, wrote the and I was just one. Yeah, clean exactly, clean slate, um, you know, program, and so I thought it was going to change overnight. Like that to me, just I probably couldn't sleep to be honest at that point in time. I was just like thinking about like the change in networking that could happen, and I was just you know at, at a loss because in, in my day to day, like there was nobody to communicate with and talk to about. It. I would try to bring it up, and they would just think, oh, it's like those folks in California, maybe Princeton, UC Berkeley. Like there were such you know few schools that were that were focused on it. And then it was probably only a few months later is when I started, when I started to, to, to blog and, and really kind of like think about like the future of, of networking. And I think along, along that path, joined Twitter, you know, met Brent virtually, you know, back, you know, back then and read, read probably every one of your, your blogs and doing, you know, packet traces on open flow and, and inspecting, you know, those, those, those deep things back then. But yeah, I just spent a lot of time like just really thinking about, you know, the future and probably, you know, as you put it, you know, Brent, it, you know, based on my, my role of where I was in back then, you know, in technical sales, I just thought, you know, we were just so focused on architecture and design. We really weren't thinking about like the day two problem at all. 
Now, now in hindsight, I think the industry got so caught up in overlays back then, talking about the X line and STT and and Genevieve and all these things. Like there was just so much like so much like mind share spent discussing the merits of an overlay and virtual switching that it just lucked out where I became obsessed shortly after with just programmability and APIs. And from there on out, had demos of Avanceable on networking, Puppet on networking. Cisco had this thing called 1PK, which was their first SDK on networking. I told that story a couple times. And so this we all apologize happened. for that, by the way, at Cisco. So we remember that. And yeah. Yeah. I had no, nothing it's, to do with that, so I won't yeah. apologize. <laughs> I, I do remember 1PK. I re it was very early, right? It was this super early yeah. thing that exposed some of those APIs. You probably <laughs> used it. It was the beginning of of that, right? But that's that's it's actually started a little while before I left Cisco, and it was remember it started with like, oh, should we we allow a Tickle interpreter to run on the machine, or a, you know, eventually a Python interpreter and a, you know, and that he said tickle. that was the, those are the roots of the automation stuff we have today, right? Then from that, Salt Puppet Chef, yada yada yada, right? Well, then that, and that's right, and, that, and that's why I always think, I, I always get, oh, the SAR, you have to deal with, you know, 1PK as an example. But in that short time frame, it was just like, in my in my perspective, it's sort of like the, the more macro thought is, wow, like so much could change over the, over the next several years with how we do operations and day-to-day. -day. So, you know, I love the time I spent. There was a few months, you know, sort of exploring 1PK, diving into Ansible and so forth, and, and you know, I, I just – you know, thank that whole movement from OpenFlow into the greater SDN movements to 1PK, just like that era is sort of, you know, laid, laid the, the, the framework and, and the foundation to, you know, where my day is spent these days in this sort of arena we call net DevOps now and APIs came about and SDN controllers with APIs, device APIs, Yang modeling, on, you know, on these, on these devices and so forth. So, you know, right now, again, very much, you know, very much focused around, you know, performing enterprise-wide network automation and, and doing that very much in a, in a public way, open source way, and, and, and really growing with the industry. And, um, you know, but that's sort of, you know, the, you know, the history along the way. And I often joke, Kevin said this probably publicly, I'll bring it up and you know, seeing Brent brings back memories over the past, over the past 10 years, kind of joke, you know, when I was onto something in 2013, you know, trying to, you know, trying to, you know, write and theorize, you know, I used to check subscribers to my blog every, every so often. There might've been one, might've been five, might've been 10. It kept increasing. And that one like point, I was, yeah, 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 yeah. It takes time, right? It takes time We're to, up to, to, to grow. Crazy. To grow we it. have and more than always... five listeners. I wasn't sure. We only had four listeners for quite a while, actually. Hundred percent growth, baby. I'm now five or six. There, there you go. Yeah. But um, I remember, I remember, I remember seeing a name get subscribed, and it was it was mcuban at gmail dot com. And nice. M Cuban, more, more wow. Cuban. Right. And even thinking about this, like 2013, I'm like, this, there's no way this is like, this is Mark Cuban and kind of doing his research or research on him. Like, you know, he built his first company and he was involved in broadcast and multicast and network backgrounds. And like, he has an IT background. And then, you know, I had sent an email. Was it really him that responded? You know, to this day, I believe it was, it was him. So it wasn't, it wasn't the, the closed circle that that validated sort of what I was thinking. Uh, I'll, I'll give credit to, I'll, I'll give credit to that one subscription to my blog who might have only ever read one article, but a year or two later he did he did tweet an article of mine. I think it was when I was when I was saying Cisco should buy Embrain for for whatever reason around open. Open B switch or whatever, but but in any case, all jokes aside, yeah, it's been a it's been a crazy ride, and I think I think open flow aside, you know, dating back to the past ten years, like that those couple years from 2010 to 2015, like really helped the industry evolve in so many, you know, so many different areas, and just thankful to be well, a part of it. The really. conversations were important. The conversations were like, you know, because I had worked on MPLS and all that stuff, right, and we sort of were at the top of that wave, and we we're like. Hmm. And we solved all the world's problems for networking. And it was really, um, it was kind of a, a soul searching kind of moment. And, and that, that's how I rec I mean, I still remember like driving to an ITF meeting with some very respected people that I still very much respect. And, 
trying to explain to them like what you could do with some of this stuff, not, you know, just the different concepts and, and disconnecting the control and data plane, which was actually not a new concept at that point. There are other iterations of that, even commercial iterations before that. They just, they just didn't work very well because we didn't have enough computing power. It's why PCE and things like that could not have worked then either. But it was interesting because it really, it taught me to, to never get dogmatic about the technology. Is it, you know, what, what's so wrong about uh, debating it against the something else? Uh, at well, the we end also, of the we also didn't think we'd have enough memory to run more than 500,000, you know, internet routes too back in the day. It's like, yeah, definitely, well, we I got think that's a million good point. routes. We were like, whoa, right? Hardware evolved, yeah. yeah. Well, and I it think was, it was the last thing it was like tear it apart, and and if it, you know, it's a sort of like that thing, you know, let it let it go free, and if it comes back, it's it's real. It's a similar thing that I learned then, and I was working with all those wicked smart network folks. <laughs> who were telling me, no, no, this stuff is, is, we don't need any of that stuff. And, and it was really a lesson to me that no matter what, it's worth exploring stuff because you never know, you know, and if well, it's, I, if it's, I, it's worth, it'll come out in the wash anyway, it has the right answer. Yeah. We, right. we, and we should really spotlight what you two are both saying. So like Jason started hearing, and it's almost identical to me, right? It was a uh, ops engineering, whatever, back in the day. And then Clean Slate Project comes out of Stanford. So the Stanford Mafia, uh, I say it lovingly, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. But, but these were really cl kind of closed door meetings. And, and, and all the, a lot of the knowledge was really kind of hoarded in the valley. And, yeah. and it got di completely distributed with, you know, and I also credit people like Greg, Pepignac, Ethan Banks, you know, I mean, Network Field Day with uh, Foskett, mm -hmm. like, you know, I mean, they really started this kind of fledgling ops community. And, and it's, you know, and, and I think it was a real wake up call for the vendors, um, you know, in, in 2010 through 2015 that, you know, they no longer have the brain trust. The community is taking back the brain trust because we can, we can program whatever we want to do with networks and it's not going to be prescriptive on how they send it. So and, and I, think, I think as well, I think we also, in those early days, I mean, you're talking about the operator side. I think we also, to be fair, need to give the Linux Foundation some credit here as well. Yeah. And, you know, we are going to do that because early on, they gave a lot of us that avenue on the developer side. Remember all those early uh, mm -hmm. summits around yeah. Open Daylight, um, a lot of the work, you know, and the OpenStack Foundation too, right? I mean, they kind of enabled this as well. And one thing that the OpenStack Foundation did very well, which you see, the LF and even the CNCF copying today is they really tried to bring the operators and the developers together. Now, mm -hmm. you could argue whether or not OpenStack was successful or not, but I think that particular thing that they no, did was No, but the point important. is that you need all of those groups together right. to actually build the right stuff. Right. And that, yeah. And I, and I think you get better solutions because you bring, instead of just a bunch of developers saying, we're going to do this crazy thing because we can, or a bunch of operators saying you can't do that, or we're going to do a different thing, put them all together, get them all involved early on and, and, and see what kind of magic comes out. Yeah. It's funny you say open daylight. I was, I was saving it for this uh, podcast. I had just cleaned out one of my file cabinet drawers. I came across one of the open daylight cars that I got at one of those summits, huh. you know, have the, ho the hoodie, the hoodie somewhere, you know, somewhere in the closet as well. But yeah, no, you know, interesting times and you bring it, bring it up open daylight and in general. I think when you think about like the things that really shifted, you mentioned Linux foundation, other foundations, you know, it's just like the nature of open source in networking. It was all like coming together though. It was yeah. like open source was right. Hatching open source networking was hatching. You know, whatever you want to call open source networking, but networking not in a commercial box that you'd buy, you know, like kind of like Brent said, networking became something you could build, not something you could mimic out of a standard spec, you know, and well, that's, that open, was the open, cool part open. for me. It was like, wow, I can run yeah. all, like I ran MPLS in my home network for a little while because I'm insane like that, but <laughs> I did because I could, you know, I could, right? I mean, why not? Sounds like you're smart to me. But you guys run BGP Same here, for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, MPLS, BGP, IP, Father, yeah. Son, Holy Ghost. We had to bless the conversation here. That's right. 
Um, yes, yeah, so, and I think we can all agree, like, open source is the ultimate disruptor. All the technologies um, brought together open source projects, it's really open source. So let's let's maybe talk a little bit. Jason, you guys are a big sponsor of uh, a couple open source projects. Maybe talk about uh, talk about what you're up to in open source and, you know, how, how people can use what you're using. Yeah, no doubt. And I, so I think for, for us, it's interesting, you know, you know, we are – you know, narrowly focused on network automation. And, you know, there's a lot of acronyms that have been around over the past couple of years, you know, one being IBN or intent-based networking. So it's like, you know, we're, our, our goal is to be able to have a, you know, loosely coupled components to create an intent-based networking system. And so users can like pick and choose what they want to use, commercial software here, open source here, and and so on. But I, I think even for us with what we're seeing day to day within the market and our customers, you know, there's no doubt some environments might use 90% commercial software, 10% open source. Others might use 90% open source and, and, and uh, you know, 10% commercial. But I think, like, like the biggest change is having at least some level of open source that allows users to have control of their environment. And I guess in just even going back over the past, you know, several years and all, all of these trends, like that for us is like the biggest thing is, is flexibility and control versus, you know, you know, if you were to go all in with commercial platforms, like there just has to be such inherent trust. There's extensibility in those platforms. And so for us, so you mentioned, you know, we're a sponsor, you know, we, we look at network automation, you know, different uh, pillars such as, you know, observed state config management, automation, orchestration. And source of truth. And so for us, you know, the biggest project we sponsor, you know, we just uh, launched it in February called Nautilbot. And, you know, it's no secret. We initially forked another project to create it back in back in February. And but so that for us is, is the biggest project for us. And so it's called Nautilbot as a source of truth and automation platform. And so, you know, it kind of, it kind of couples, uh, it's, it's, it, it's kind of like a, like a, d a double identity in that, it's a source of truth database at its core, but we continue to enhance the 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 application or SDK to build apps on top to complement any architecture or solution. And you know the apps could be really really lightweight and basic for a model that you want to extend, uh, BGP or so forth, or it could be a full blown application that you want to create and write. Then you take advantage of all the non-functional things of the platform itself, security, SSO, logging, all those things. Because, you know, we've seen so many customers and users build full-blown custom apps. And and to do that, like, the, the time it takes to get it into prod is just insane versus if you have a platform in production, it's easier to layer in on top, sort of like this northbound, even going back to SDN, right? Learned a lot with like these northbound applications and so forth, it becomes easier to couple them with the system. And and so that's sort of, you know, the largest project that we have. And, you know, we have some dating back to 2014 and 15 with Ansible and so on to be able to have just, you know, tactical but meaningful things that just help round out automation uh, strategies. But for us, we definitely take you know, you know, we like to call it an enterprise wide view around network automation because now there's so many domains and there's, oh, there always has been from wireless and WAN and LAN and uh, firewall. And typically any product out there is, is focused on a given domain. And, you know, we definitely, as a services business, you know, we stay very much focused sort of, you know, how to be, um, you know, the glue that can help, help manage all of these and build the right solutions to consume network resources the best way for a given user environment. And so, yeah, that, you know, we'll that often, brownfield we'll, aspect. It's, it's yeah, so it's important. Like, we'll, yeah, we'll often like round out our solutions and even in our demos, you mentioned, I think you've seen a few of these, Brent, but we'll, we'll always talk about things like ServiceNow or chat ops or portals because it's, it's often forgotten about. If, if we were to deploy something that's not used, it's a failure. And often, you know, having been around for a long time, you guys, you know, hear the jokes like Cisco works, or Cisco, you know, the Cisco Works platform for LMS years ago. Like, did it work or did it not work? You know, you know, sort of Cisco Works didn't work. And so, you know, we didn't, we don't want to have network management tools. That's really what they are at the end of the day that aren't used. And so for us, I would say independent of how it's happening under the covers, 
Like yeah. we need to understand like the culture of the customer of the user and figure out figure out like the best consumption layer. Is it a portal? Is it a chat command? Is it is it service now? What type of auditability is required for all these changes and so on? Or is it just Git? Like is it just a pipeline? You merge it and then boom, it's gonna it's gonna get get deployed. So that's sort of where uh, you know. No, it's interesting you say that. Today. I was I was kind of thinking about this the other day in terms of OSS NMS, and it, it kind of intersected with what we were just talking about earlier, which is like questioning why we do it. Like, well, we've had this OSS monolithic OSS thing here for the last 20 years. Do we keep gluing stuff onto it, or what you're saying, you know? Does this make any sense anymore? You know, should we tear this apart into these constituents part, constituent parts, and indeed run that as just a little automation thing that you know goes out and checks this thing and comes back and says okay. Um, and it it's it, I, I've been thinking about this for years. Like and and my experience recently building you know these big 5G deployments, where some of them the 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 assumed answer is, oh yeah, there's some giant OSS, you know, there's something, there's some orchestrator monster thing, we've got to spend a million bucks and park in here or, or spend a million bucks building, rather than like what you're doing. Yeah, that's why I think even as you you know say some of those like the larger OSSs like for us now it's it's just trying to like think about it at a, at a service layer at a service level, in terms of being able to you know, supplement or replace any given component as an example. That's why if something is so tightly coupled, then, you know, then, you know, it just raises more questions. And so, again, I just like thinking about like a loosely coupled system that gives you that closed loop system and you can pick and choose the components that make sense. But as we grow, you know, we definitely we would love to have an opinionated stack um, in open in the open source space like the lamp stack or you know open stack even I give this example in the past like I would love I think I think we get there as we continue to to hire and scale our business but you know I, I envision a world you know like the open stack for network automation and uh, and maybe for better or for worse you know we'll we'll find out but when we talk about source of truth observed state uh, telemetry config automation and so on you know, OpenStack had had maybe you know some some primitives there for networking that you guys are way more in, in depth than I, you know, I, I ever was back then. But if we were to view all of like the core pillars of network automation, like could there be you know could there be the you know the general APIs? Like is it worth the effort or is it just you know good enough to have that industry level architecture to guide to guide users on their journey? You know, with each of these components and stacks. That's the weird thing. Like what what I've found over the years is kind of goes in cycles, right? So like I mentioned the five G stuff we're at today, there's no such thing as what you describe, like an industry standard stack. It literally every one is different. It's like a you know, I, I show people like this picture. I said where we want to get to is that's your industry standard stack. <laughs> what we have today is more like more like this crazy thing. And Maybe that's what happens is over time as we get, you know, best practices and we build things and it kind of narrows the funnel. Today, the aperture is way out here, right? And that, that kind of, that's what happened with Stack, remember, and some of the other stuff. Stack, there was 50 distros and Mad Dash for everything, you know, and now how many are there? They're still used in production, but how many are, are used in production today? Two? Well, One and that's... And and that brings up an interesting point. So the counterpoint to my earlier praise of the LF and CNCF might be now, if we look at where what you guys are saying, at what point does a platform just become noise, right? I mean, if you look at like the eye charts of having all of these projects and things going on and everyone does their own thing, it's less collaboration and purely marketing at that point. And, and it's hard yeah. as a user to figure out what's useful, right? So there is that kind of like, tug in that or that push back and but that's forth what's happened with sdn things. too right sdn oh, is yeah. no longer a thing it's an in, it's just part of the road now it's part of the you know kubernetes has a lot of sdn concepts and functions under the hood nobody calls them an sdn thing kubernetes has a lot of ip tables rules under the hood but <laughs> and that too <laughs> 
And but I you know what I mean? Like it's, you know, like all of these, these concepts that they eventually just get kind of smooshed into the thing and we move. It's we like move five to 10 so. years, you know, like, like five, five to seven years, you have to go through that cycle. And like, even thinking back again, I was, I was naive in 2011 and 12 thinking things were going to change overnight, but now really seeing you know, my new, my new vantage point over the past several years, it's, it's sort of in the network automation space, like we're, we're very much focused on architecture and I'm a little biased. I don't think many other organizations are, you know, that, you know, they're more focused around writing a script or, and, you know, writing a script or a playbook or like a one-off, one-off job versus really thinking about like the larger organizational um, impact automation can have and how that impacts just architecture. So, you know, with where we are today, you know, maybe it's the next or the next couple of years, the industry continues to mature. And, you know, I think we're, you know, we're uh, playing a part in there, but, you know, I, I think maybe it's just the nature that you kind of have to go through those, those growing pains, you know, seeing what works. And I think it was Kyle, one of the old podcasts you know, that you guys did, you had a, you had a good line that I really liked. It was, something around like standards, like you have to, you have to go through the process, like to create the standards. I forget what, what your comment was, but it was like, you, you can't create it in a vacuum early, too early on. Like you actually have to experience it in real world deployments to, to drive, to drive those standards. To test it out, right. To stretch it out. I, yeah, we're, we've, we've gone through that several times, right. It, depending on the technology i mean that's that's the folly in fighting about the tech before you can talk about anybody using it it's like i mean as early on in my career as you know we were having debates about rsvpt etc you know i mean that kind of stuff like and it was it literally a con or ospf and isis right isis like it's just at the end of the day you know the two trains came up to basically the same thing you know and it and and so all of that fighting and gymnastics was for what? I mean, really, the point is is about deploying it and using it, you know. And um, like I'm I'm actually doing a or working on a presentation right now about a you know open source stuff for for uh, my current place. And one of the things in there that's important is is that it's usable, right? I mean, projects that are not usable are are toys or whatever, right? And maybe that's another kind of segue. Kyle into the LF discussion is that those organizations really need to manage these projects because when they're in their life cycle at the top, when everybody's into it, the spotlights are on it. We, we're giving away t-shirts and, and stuff like that to folks like Jason. When we start to wane though, on the other side of that curve, what happens, right? When people evacuate the building, I mean, you, you can look at stack like that right now today where it's a, it, it's a small fraction of who used to work on it. And so who's keeping that thing going and what happens if you've injected that as an intrinsic part of your infrastructure, what happens? Like, is it, it's not going to be there forever, but what are you doing? Maybe, maybe this is a sign of the times, right? I, I think that way back when going back a decade or so before the whole SDN thing, when I was doing network engineering, all of the stacks that I bumped into were all single vendor like you you put your money into cisco you're never going to fired for picking cisco like it's all going to work you're going to get the training you're going to get everything else right i think over time people have realized that putting all of your trust in a single vendor or a single stack is a terrible idea and that it's a better idea to kind of split right don't become really dependent on one architecture one component one piece of the platform right be a bit more loosely coupled I think that's where like Jason's point about let's figure out the architecture, right? Let's work on this from what does the business need? And then how do we figure that out into an architecture that's going to work? Keep all the pieces loose and agile so that we can move it around because, you know, maybe one of those projects isn't going to be there anymore. Or maybe, you know, chat ops isn't for you and that really you need a different interface and it would really suck to have based like your entire multi-million dollar investment on going down one direction if you can't pivot i think okay, you know that's... you don't need it or you're not going to use it but it's cool so we got it yeah i mean all that stuff yeah like you know the same with nms right but, <laughs> it's exactly the same well, but, argument like you don't want but, the one thing that does all of the stuff you'd rather have the little bit so you can cherry pick the functionality which is like important to you and have that working in the way that you want it to 
So you, you you said something important earlier. You you know you said the architecture that you know the shop that's deploying this thing is is interested in using, and I just one modifier to that is the implementation architecture, right? Because that governs like what are we selling? How are they using it? How are users using it? And then you got to work your way back to you know what you were saying, Dave. You know like even. I mean, that's that's what happened to me when I was at BT. We sort of suddenly were on the other side of the table, and these vendors showed up and said, hey, we design things for all of our customers. Here you go. And I said, yeah, thanks. We'll be back. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. You know, and that's kind of part of and – that, and that's part of what's happened, too, that I've noticed in the transition, but you've also seen it over-rotate, right? You can't build all your own stuff. you got to ask yourself, what are you in the business of selling or what are you in the business of doing? Um, you know, if you're selling breakfast cereal, what do you, what business do you have in building a Kubernetes distribution? You know, I mean, that kind of, that kind of thing, right? So no, what's your well, well, along these lines, I, 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 this discussion reminded me in 2019, Ian Wells and I gave a talk, uh, I think at a few different places, but certainly at the OpenStack Summit that year called Open Source Networking, the Useful, the Scrap Heap, and the Broken. And the idea was around this concept that you all are talking about is of when, you know, what's the shelf life of an open source project? How can you evaluate this? When should you decide that it's no longer useful? How do you wind these things down? Um, and we tried to approach it from the angle of you were an operator or a user. You're wandering in, you read about this cool thing, you know, uh, like, you know, tungsten fabric or something bizarre, right? There, you're like, is that even around? What's happening with, you know, how do you evaluate this and make this decision? Um, as an example, and there's plenty of other projects we could pick. I mean, that just came to mind, but you know, there's, how do you do this, right? And I think from an operations perspective and from someone who's not steeped in open source, it's a challenging thing to do. Yeah, and you can, I've talked to customers who have felt duped, you know, by they've gone and deployed a thing and then went, you know, two years later went, well, that company's out of business, they're not supporting this. And hopefully there's another one that supports you know, the thing, you know, whether it's stack or whatever, you know, um, you know, ODL or whatever. Um, so that that's what I'm talking about. Like, unless you're planning continuously about what you're doing, you know, assuming everything is cool might not be the right way to do it. Yeah, that's a good point. And I like so the and, right now. Yeah. Sorry, Brent. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no. And, and so what Jason's talking about, I think, makes a, makes a hell of a lot of sense, right? So it's taking those existing environments. It's not talking about ripping and replacing everything. And so, like, I think we've gotten so accustomed to saying, well, this all needs to go and we need to, you know, here's this entire stack. Well, it's about integrating what's existing. It's about what skill set you have on-prem to be able to do these things because nothing's for free. I mean, you know, like, if open source was easy, then we wouldn't have commercial companies, obviously. You know, people want to throw it to choke. Uh, one of my favorite examples, uh, this, I saw this a couple of years back, you did this as a network field day where you're showing chat ops, right? So like that's probably, you're probably the first person I saw really talking about chat ops and, and networking. So it's, you know, you're hooking in a service now request that gets, you know, fed down into, you know, whether it's triggered out of service now or whether it's triggered out of chat ops uh, and, and automating things like, I think it was like, you know, port activations, port deactivations, VLAN changes, things like that. Uh, but it has such implication across the board. You change control, right? You know, I, I think that's like the, you know, the low hanging fruit. You start stepping into that. I think the holy grail starts to be where you know all your configuration, your CMDB is in a Git repo, and now everything's automated. The flip side of that is when you have somebody like Facebook that managed to down their entire East Coast hub uh, last week, you know, from automation, and they didn't have async serial connections out of band. Like right? any any network engineer worth of salt. Will, will you know can't sleep at night if he can't get to he or she can't get to you know their their, their remote box their boxes remotely so like maybe you know where is that evolving to so are you seeing are you actually seeing get get deployments I'd love to hear it yeah I think there's like both ends of the spectrum from you know in that thought of from service now and and chat ops the one comment I was going to make on that even your examples very very unsexy but just super practical and they occur day to day. This goes back to the point around really understanding where time is being spent. You know, we, we've had environments, we've seen like literally 20,000, 30,000 ServiceNow tickets within a several month period. And some of them were 
or balancing ports to reboot access points, right? Little things like that. So maybe a chat command just makes it super simple. So instead of opening a ticket, routing it to, you know, the right the right person, you know, let the service desk or help desk just manage that type of thing. And so, you know, there's definitely, you know, a lot of the network organizations that we support are thinking about providing like the right level of service to their internal customers, right? And doing that via, via other means. I would say there's probably a split when we look at, I guess the enterprise space, like those that are, you know, looking at like the self-service functionality and those that are, that are really embracing, I would say, you know, some form of Git ops to drive things. I would say by drive things in terms of being ready to deploy from Git, but I would say like the vast majority, if not all of them are leveraging Git day to day. That's, you know, the question there, there's, there's no doubt if there's scripts or playbooks or YAML files, all, all all these artifacts that exist, I would say like that's been probably like one of the biggest changes in the past several years of networking. Like there's there's Git probably, I have to believe there's Git. If you're doing network automation, like Git is being used in some fashion. Even if you're not, I think there's some network engineers that are just trying to back up configurations and push them to a repo just for, you know, audit history. I think like the amount of testing and CI that's being done, it's still probably in its infancy. I think we're going to continue to see good things there. I'm a big fan of what Batfish, you know, the Batfish crew is doing from Intention Net, be able to do some modeling. I think that, and I hope it's still very early on for, you know, for them. Like even looking back over the past several years, you know, some of my aha moments, you know, I, I think like Ansible for me was a big one, seeing what it could do, you know, going back in 2013 or 2014. I think Batfish is, you know, they're still, you know, small and growing, but being, what they could do as part of uh, you know a value added pipeline for for change workflow and networking is is going to be great but it's still early on again in terms of talking to customers and users like there's some that just can't get out of their own way with process to, to automate um you know just mass changes for SNP community strings let's say they just can't yeah you know, it's just like there's so much effort to get the right tooling in place process in place to do it we start bringing up pipelines like it, it, it actually is a multi-year journey for these larger organizations and i think you have to be comfortable with that i think there's some general myths you, you know you can automate the network as broad as that is as broad as that is in six months or 12 months you know, it is it is years you know if you're a global organization if you're a small and nimble shop where you have a, a lean team sure you, you could pick the key workflows and automate them but it's definitely definitely a lot of ways to to go about it but there's no doubt like get you know linux skills get skills you're becoming more and more prevalent uh, by the day in the networking realm well that leads into kind of our, our last question that we tend to throw you know so what's your what's your advice for network engineers out there that are looking to evolve evolve their careers and uh kind of explore explore the future yeah, great question, and, and I, I do love it. I think there's a lot of ways to answer it around, like, the tools and the tech, and there's a lot more out there. But really, I would say, when you look at somebody who's been a career network engineer, like, I, I really do believe, like, the best thing right now is to is to think through workflows, is to think through how they do their work. I remember having a conversation before Network to Code around, you know, dealing, talking to a, a customer around, they just got so many calls around troubleshooting T1 circuits, or like dual T1s, and and trying to figure out like how they troubleshot. And like they would, they made a statement like in 20 seconds. It's like, no, let's go step by step. Like, how do you know which router to go to, its neighbor to go to, what commands you run, and all those things. So I would say it could be for a change, but it also could be for like read-only automation or diagnostic troubleshooting. Anything a network engineer is doing, I think, in order to ensure there's going to be a, a successful journey along the way you know we you know as a networking you know industry and for you know going down to the individual level i would say like my definite my, my guidance is to is to practice writing down how they do things meaning if they were going on vacation for three months how would they tell a new hire how they do what they do i think like that skill to get in the habit of doing workflow diagrams and bolt ties list, you know, is going to be super important to be able to undertake a network automation journey. If you've already started, it'll just, it'll still help and it'll accelerate the automation because then, then you can hand that to 
your you know your developer self or hand it to a, a automation team or software team along along the way but there's no doubt i would say writing down workflows and getting in that habit and reviewing them with peers to kind of brainstorm on on how to optimize work and how how workflows can change with automation is sort of where i would say you know a great a great place to be that requires no automation skills um, for for that person an individual I love it. It's such a unique answer. It's something I, I don't think I've heard anybody say, so that's really important. Still well, with that, we're at the top of the hour. Um, real quick, uh, thanks to T1 Nexus, our sponsor. They pay for our uh, website and um, Libsyn. We'll buy some feeds. optics. Yeah, so <laughs> they sell optics. Go buy them. So, Jason, thanks, man. This was awesome. Uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, we're super pumped to see where you take Network to Code. And, uh, yeah, we'll have you back Thank for you, updates. Jason. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate this it. This was fun. Thanks, Jason. See you, everybody. Have a great evening. Stay Bye. safe out there.